Hello, family, and welcome to the Explore the Extraordinary podcast. My name is Betty Guadagno, and today I am joined by Maria. And Maria is a beautiful spiritual connection that I've recently come across. She's an author, she's a teacher, and she's just a cool chick. So I'm really excited to introduce her to the audience here at IONS. And I'm going to give you some space, Maria, to share about who you are. And we're going to talk about all things spiritual. And so I'll toss it right over to you. You, I love that. Cool, cool chick. I like that. <laughs> I feel at home here. It feels like two two cool chicks hanging out. Love it. Um, Betty, you know, I'm so thrilled to be on here. And just a little bit about me. I was born in Miami, um, Cuban American. So I speak Spanish. Um, but I speak more English just because I was born in the States. But um, that's my background. And I love Cuban coffee, as you see here, my cafe cubano. And yeah, I was um, originally, as I said, from Miami, living in, I left, I left Miami and I lived in LA for 15 years, came back and did the circle around and now I'm back in Florida, but living in Naples, Florida now. I am a spiritual teacher and speaker on happiness. Uh, my core teachings are based on the book, of Course in Miracles, which is a spiritual book that helps with changing your perception from fear to love. Um, I love what I do. I um, attend to my clients on one on one basis monthly. I also have coaching group. I also do speaking events live. Um, in 2017, I came out with this guy over here, Live Your Happy, as you can see here and then it also came out in spanish vive feliz and then we have it over here in japanese but japanese you gotta I kind of move it this way <laughs> and these are the three versions of live your happy um and i i just i love my life i i've had a transformation in my life which i'm sure betty and i will get into um i lived a very i can say isolated life um i lived a life that was um filled with addictions um mainly with addictions of my happiness being outside of me not so much addictions to alcohol and drugs, but more addicted to thinking and believing that love was outside of me. And that could have been with, with um, men, um, that could have been with money, that could have been with my career. It's like I felt that everything outside of me defined me. <clears throat> and I started to have this awakening experience, which I'm sure me and my girl, uh, my, my, my hot chick over here, and I will go over um, how I was able to begin to change my mind and begin to recognize that all the happiness and joy that I could ever want is actually available to me right here, right now. And it's not just me saying it like, you know, woo woo or anything. Like it's literally the truth. It's something that I've literally experienced. And I'm sure that Betty has spoken to that many, many times before. Like, this is like the reality, like this is the truth. Like we are love and, and there is no opposite. Um, even though it appears that there is. I um, have a young son. His name is Ari. He's five years old. I really desired to have a child for a very long time. And I never knew how that would look because my relationships were always a disaster. Um, but fortunately enough, um, after a failed marriage, I got remarried in 2017. And I met my husband, which is also a spiritual guru in, in his own way. He's an amazing soul. And I was able to get pregnant after suffering an ectopic pregnancy in my 40s. So I got pregnant with Ari at 40. I had him at 41. So that was already a miracle in itself. Um, and I, I'm i constantly just in the conversation. I'm always in the conversation. I'm constantly, if I'm not with my coaching group online on WhatsApp, I'm, you know, on a Zoom call. I am speaking, you know, at events. Like this is my jam every single day. This is what I do daily. I wake up and I serve spirit. I wake up and I serve God, if that's what you want to call it, love. Um, that is my mission. And that's what I do. That's beautiful. Ooh, I, I love how you said every day I wake up and I serve spirit. That is so beautiful. That's a much better way to look at it, like a full schedule. Like, you know what? I'm serving spirit all day. I really love that. <laughs> Uh, I love so much of what you said. And yeah, I definitely want to get into a conversation about, well, I mean, some of the stuff that came up for me when you were talking, especially when you were kind of talking about seeing love, despite the fact that it appears that maybe love is not all that there is. Um, but I do kind of want to talk a little bit about your personal transformation, if you'll just take some space and maybe share about that. And then we can kind of get into some of the teaching. 
Yeah, I, I, could, I feel that my first t- transformation happened when I was a young girl, when I realized that there was something more than just this world and this body that I was seeing. And it happened to me when I was about five or six years old that I was sitting on a couch. And I asked, I asked a question such as, I guess, because at the time I was going to, my brother would take me a lot to the Catholic church by our house. And he was so sweet. He would walk me around the garden and show me Jesus and show me Mary and show me the symbolisms. It was very sweet. And I was, and I heard at one point, Holy Spirit. And I was like, well, what's that? So I remember on the couch, just asking just a very naive, innocent question, like what's the Holy Spirit? And I remember very clearly, it wasn't like I saw presence, but I felt like an energetic field of where I looked to the right. And this essence said to me, I am the Holy Spirit and I'm within you. And I, I, I I was like, wow, that's amazing. And I felt this love and connection at such a young age. It wasn't like I was playing with dolls or anything. Like this was a real experience. I still remember it to this day. And I don't remember anything from when I was little Betty, like nothing. And ever since then I realized, wow, there's just something more. And I was in my whole, my whole life, even when I was young, I was always very um, connected to books. Like it could be anything that had to do with spirituality, anything that had to do with positive thinking. I think one of the first uh, books that I had heard about was an old book that's called The Power of Positive Thinking. And, um, you know, all these types of books and philosophies, I was just so enthralled by them. And I would begin to live a life of just reading a lot and and trying to understand all these concepts But my biggest shift came through um, in my early 20s when I got very depressed. And maybe a lot of people watching this can relate to having like an early life crisis. (laughs) Not midlife crisis, like early life. Like I had it early, like 19, 20. Maybe you call it a midlife crisis. I don't know. But mine felt like just earlier in in my teenage years. And I was feeling very um like lost and and disillusioned I had been modeling already for a few years um feeling very insecure about the way I looked um even though I was aesthetically look good I didn't feel beautiful um I felt insecure in my business I got so depressed I, I would like work and I couldn't even write an invoice I my thoughts were making me crazy that's how I know that everything has to do with the mind and what we're thinking and believing at any given moment, because my, my mind was keeping me in my bed. And I, and to think that I was a very positive person and to think I was a very upbeat person to get to this point was very odd. And I didn't understand what was happening until my parents told me you're going through a depression. And I was like, what is that? Like, what is the depression? And why don't they teach this at school? (laughs) Cause I was like, this is like a big deal. Like I can't handle myself right now. And that, that space Betty got me in a, in, in like a a search. Like it was like, why am I, I feel like, I felt like I was losing my mind. And it's funny because it wasn't that, you know, I had such a horrible upbringing or had such a bad childhood. It was just basically me having a turmoil in my mind and just basically not being able to function. So I found like one day I went out in the car and I remember I went to the bookstore and I saw a book by an author. Um, Her name is Marion Williamson. And she wrote a book called Return to Love of which I found at the bookstore in the middle of this crisis. And I read it and all she would talk about all day long was the Course of Miracles is Blue Book of Course of Miracles. And I didn't understand what she was talking about. And, but it sounded intriguing. And five years later, I would actually go to a course at a church based on this book. And I began to read it and I began to kind of shift my perception a little bit about life. I wouldn't get out of my depression right away, but at least I was reading something. I know that you've spoken to this too of like really reading and and having all this education. I think that that's what started to help me is like reading and starting to recognize something different could happen or I could have a shift, Um, which I ultimately did. But it's funny, I actually got a big job while I was very depressed. So when people say that you need to have a positive mindset to be successful, it's not true. Just FYI. because I was in the lowest part of my life. And I remember dragging myself out of bed for an interview for the World Wrestling Entertainment. Okay, at the time it was World Wrestling Federation, but now it's not WWE. 
World Wrestling Entertainment. And I went to be the host of their show in Spanish. That would mean I would interview the good guys in the ring and, you know, next to the ring, the good guys and the bad guys and kind of just lead the whole soap opera as the host and the narrator of the whole thing. So I went for the audition, 500 girls auditioned Betty. I think like half in New York, half in Miami. I walked into the room. I was still super depressed. I had to like get myself out of bed. And they had me do these imp improvisations and they had me do this. And I guess I got to the point that I didn't hardly really give a shit. Like I was like, just life, I'm done with you. Like whatever, I'm just gonna have fun. And I think that kind of helped me too. Anyways, like two weeks later, I couldn't believe it. Like still under this dark cloud, I um I I I I heard from my agent that I got the job that I got the job and I ended up to record like 20 something episodes for Univision nationally I I met the Rock Stone Cold Steve all, all the big wrestlers <laughs> so I've had a big career even though I was depressed um but ultimately I feel that one of the reasons that I had such a bad mind trip I think was just so many things growing up like not understanding life, not understanding like why did I not, didn't I feel um, like all like this is not all there was, or I was abused when I was younger, or like all these like I I feel like I would I got to, into that depression because of not understanding like my identity or what what is life about or why am I here like I felt that th that questioning got me very depressed because I was starting to get unhooked. And not understanding what is reality, what is truth, and I, I got a little crazy. Wow, I I'm so grateful to learn pieces of your story that I didn't know yet. It's I know awesome. I don't think you knew about the rest. I definitely didn't. But you know, I you know I think that I love how you said like you don't have to have a positive mindset to like have things happen. It's true. Although I think that maybe you kind of named it already that the fact that you had kind of released the tension of control around it, you were like, I don't care, you know? And I think yes. that that's actually the key to manifesting success in your life is to really truly release. And you don't have to be going through like a bout of depression to release. You can just make the conscious choice to release the outcome of something. But I think that that might've had something to do with it, but that is such a cool story. And some stuff came up for me while you were talking. So let's get into a dialogue about it you're talking about reality. So I'd like to know how you now define reality. For me, Betty, reality is, is it like this right now? Like my understanding, like right now, this is reality. I see you, you see me, or it appears you're there. I'm here. And, and, and when I don't have a judgment on it, I'm in reality. I'm in love. If, if where I am, I, if I want to be anywhere different than where I am, I'm not in reality. I'm actually in the illusion because I'm wanting things to be different than what they are. And then, then I lose big time. We all lose. My reality is the acceptance of what is wanting to be here with Betty because we've made a commitment to be in this interview. And if I would want it to be any anything different than what it is, then I lose. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. And I, and I, I like that. Maybe can you speak a little bit more to the illusion? I know you and I are both students of A Course in Miracles, and maybe we can go into a little bit about what that means when you say illusion. Illusion. So, so truth is, um, is truth is love. Truth is, um, the presence of peace. Truth is, um, non-duality. Okay. Now the illusion is is part of the egoic thought system is part of the fear illusion is is when you are lost in in the dream I like to say the course also says the dream it's like kind of in a trans state of where you you you're believing your false narrative your false thoughts that could be um that you are um not worthy it could be that you're in a relationship and then you feel um, disillusioned in it. Like you, you really believe that that person is the problem. Um, you are in the victim victimization mentality. That is when you're falling into the illusion. You're falling asleep. It doesn't mean that it's forever. And it doesn't mean that it's the truth. It's actually not the truth, but the experience is, is that it is you know, which is something we had addressed at the beginning. Remember when I said that, you know, even though it doesn't appear 
that love is all there is. Um, it, it is, love is all there is, but there's this appearance of this illusion, this experience of this illusory world. Um, and it's, I know it's hard to wrap around. And again, maybe some of the concepts I might talk about here, you might, you might be like, what, you know, although I, I really, um, encourage everyone to, to have that willingness to just have that openness because, um, it might, maybe later on you'll understand, but I, I, I even think that you'll understand and even connecting energetically, like maybe not even with the words that there'll be a certain understanding of what we're talking about. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. Exercising that spiritual principle of open-mindedness was definitely one of the gateway tools to my awareness expanding, you know, cause I was so rigid in my view of everything. Like you could not tell me that I was wrong and, you know, just being able to remain open-minded even still, you know, like I have teachings that are very dear to me that I hold like in very high regard, but I also remain open-minded that it can shift and, and I still remain open-minded to other teachings, you know? So I really like um, the idea of just being open to receiving. And, and I feel like I have so many things in my mind that are like basically on a shelf in the back that like, I don't know why I heard the things that I heard or what that information is for, but eventually it might like come off the shelf and be like, here it is, you know, like, here's your little present. So another thing that came up when you were talking about yourself and um, and who you are was, uh, I, I kind of wanted to see if maybe you would talk a little bit about like what it's like to be a conscious, aware parent and in like a relationship with another sort of like spiritual warrior. Um, I, if you're willing to, I'd love to sort of hear some of that. Yeah, well, I, I, you kind of make me cry just like getting into the conversation, obviously, because my eyes are tearing up. I'm like, okay, I, I think I need to shut my espresso before I go there. Um, so I, one of the, the key points of my relationship, my my husband's name is Christian, is one of one of the reasons why this gets me emotional is one one I'm a very sensitive person, also a very emotional person, but um my I always my whole um I always call we have like our big kahuna teaching of of our of our lifetime and I I know that you can relate to this so my big big kahuna one of my lifetime has been my relationship with men and it's I, I've always been addicted especially like is it post before when you say post pro post marriage or pre marriage I don't know what pre before before before, yeah. before before um I had this addiction to 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 men and and being addicted to looking for my love outside of me it was something that um it was an addiction and and if I didn't have a relationship in my life I wasn't happy um the person outside of me you know completed me I love the movie Jerry Maguire and the part when Tom Cruise says at the door you complete me I love that I love the remake song they did a song about it I could cry about it was like that's the mentality I had um and I would constantly through my 20s and 30s looking for love outside of me like even when I was studying even though I was a spiritual you know um student I it's like I was in limbo like I was still had this addiction to that so b that being said I feel that when you have an addiction like that <laughs> it's like you get to a point that you're like done and I know you can relate to that it was like I am so done with this um vice that I have and trying to convince a man to love me or trying to convince trying to convince them that I can change them so that they can be good boyfriends or something like just this twisted thing. And I actually speak a lot about this in my book, live you're happy about my relationships. Like I'll speak about the Buddha guy, you know, I, I call them different names, like, or the director, or this guy, like there's these different kind of characters that kind of help me wake up to where I am now. Um, I feel that with my forgiveness um, practice, which forgiveness in the teachings of the course is basically releasing judgment. Like you let go of judgment. That's what forgiveness is. It's like you, you start to see things from a clearer perspective of where you see it very neutral. And I began to look at my past. Um, and I think this is very helpful for anyone. Um, I had my father committed suicide when I was three months old. And the narrative dialogue within, thank you. The narrative dialogue within my mind was that I'm abandoned. I'm, I'm abandonable. Like I, I deserve to be abandoned. 
And it was my first relationship with a man, three months old, kill, he, he literally killed himself. So ever since that trauma happened, I didn't know it was an issue until I started to talk to spirit about it. But um, I started to have uh, go back in time and begin to look at all my relationship with, with men. Now, this is um, a mystical experience I had one time on the couch. I, I, I was like crying one day and I was telling spirit, I want to let go of this situation. We're looking for men out, men out of myself. I'm tired of trying to convince people to love me. Like that was also the question. And I had this experience, mystical experience with spirit that said, you need to forgive. And then I was like, okay, well, forgive what? And they said, forgive your father. And I had didn't know that that needed to be forgiven. And then spirit said to me, you need to forgive all the men in your life. I was like, holy shit, that's that's a lot of men. My husband now asked me, how many? I was like, that's, you know, you don't need to know that. <laughs> so I had to go back in time I literally went back in time and I did this this process that spirit gave me that was specifically for me of where later I share my book which is a seven step forgiveness process and it's this process of looking back at all my relationships of what I made them mean what I made them mean through my egoic perspective like what I really believed them to be each and every relationship and then going through each one and looking at them from the perspective of love and spirit, but really asking spirit, spirit, what is really real here? What is the truth? And spirit would give me the truth. The biggest truth that I received, I mean, it was a powerful exercise. It took me sev seven days. It was seven days and it kicked my ass, literally, um, is what I got from spirit is that my father never abandoned me, that my father could never abandon me, that my true father is God. And that God would never abandon me. That, that That's not my father. Uh, and he did me a favor. That is the message I got. What do you mean he did me a favor? That was my dialogue. Was What do you mean he did me a favor? Did you a favor because my father was an alcoholic and he was very jealous. And his soul, I was told that his soul left to give me space so that my soul could evolve in this lifetime and do what it needed to do. That him being in my life, crazy, right, buddy? You could probably speak more to this than I can because this is kind of crazy. I didn't have to have a you know near death experience to 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 go through that, right? Um, and 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 I and I got your father left because he wanted to make space for you to be able to complete whatever you need to complete in this lifetime. So it was actually out of love, like he it, it left it left for you. And I was like, what a completely radical way to see it. That's fear to love. That's the change of perception. That's that's the letting go of the illusion that we were talking about, right? So I did this with 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 all of my relationships. That was my biggest one. And that's when I had a, one of my biggest awakenings. And that awakening happened later in my life. It happened around 20, 2015, 2016. Um, and what I realized at that moment was my self-sabotage, because I talked to spirit again. I said, okay, spirit, I'm done with my exercise. I'm ready. I'm ready for my relationship. I'm ready for life. And spirit said, no, you're not. And I said, what do you mean I'm not? And then I was given the, um, I was given the insight that, um, not really that, and we all go through this. It's like, we, we think that we're ready. We say that we're ready, but we're not. There's a self-sabotage. There's making exceptions. Um, there's making excuses. Um, there's making compromises. And this is one of the key blocks in spirituality. And this could be in anything. This could be in any type of spirituality. One of the key blocks is the underlying guilt or underlying um, sabotage of, of really in our mind saying, okay, I want to change, but there's this like underlying narrative of not really. And what that means is, it's like, it's like all this time I wanted to be in a relationship with a healthy relationship with a man. And all of a sudden, I had this narrative in the back of thinking that my father abandoned me, that not forgiving my father, not forgiving these relationships. That's how, and not that you have to go back and do this process. I'm just saying that was my awakening experience of when I realized the self-sabotage and, and, and I realized from spirit, wait a second, all my life, I've been thinking I want, you know, be the, you know, I am the light of the world. I want to, you know, live at peace or I want to be an inspiration or, um, you know, I want to be successful. I want money, but in the back, it's like, well, I want to look for money outside of myself, or I want this person to complete me. Right. So it's like, you got to be really careful of like, it's like, I am love and I am love period. 
That's it. Or I am abundance and the recognition that abundance is recognizing that you in truth are as God created you, you in truth are as love created you, whatever word resonates with you. But there's that, 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 that needs to match. And that was the biggest awakening that I had. The one of my father, the understanding of that story. And also when I got the instruction of, okay, no, you, you're not ready <laughs> or or you think you are, but you're not. That was the first time. And I don't know if this makes any sense. This is a crazy conversation because this is so freaking radical. I'm sorry. People must be like, go, go for go, go boss. And not the cereal, right? Um, At that moment, it's like, I realized like that was my biggest sabotage. Like that I, you want to change, but not really. And that, that was a big deal for me. That was a big deal for me because it's the first time. And I'll say it here. And I've said it before. It's the first time I was actually honest with myself. Like really, really honest with myself. It's the first time that I actually was honest. Like, no, I'm not ready. And then me being that authentic opened up a whole new world for me, if that makes sense. There's so much there for you. Yeah, for there is so much there. Uh, um, well, we started the conversation because I was asking about like having a conscious partner. So I that's imagine so that after, after doing all of that work, that's like when you were able to invite in a conscious partner into your life and have the rest of your story unfold. But you did say so much and I just want to identify with some of it just for, you know, like just for connection purposes. But yeah, you know, like when I had my spiritual experience, my father also committed suicide and I heard this message that was very loud and clear. And it was, I have been digging the well, the, the well of living water for you. So when you just kind of said like to make space, it just clicked for me. And I was like, oh yeah, that is like what that means. Like this, this well of water is like, that's the space so that I can accomplish in this life. What could never have been accomplished if that, that life would have taken place, you know? So I really appreciate that just like on a personal note. And then, yeah, just, there's so much that you said, you know, I, I kind of wanted to maybe share like a little tool that I use for my inner saboteur, um, because I think that this is really a relatable topic. We're talking, I mean, like when you're talking, I'm hearing codependency and in my own life, you know, I've had to heal my own, like limit, my limiting beliefs around codependency and also limerence, which is like the obsession with people. Like I have, I have had many, many obsessive relationships with people in my mind. They don't exist like in real life. Uh, but like, I can go into a fantasy and be like, this person is my partner for everything. And they're like, I don't know who you are. Um, <laughs> But, you know, like some of the tools that I used was I designed my inner saboteur. And, and I, I really, I love how you're talking about that self-sabotage because like, yeah, it's kind of, you know, like those two different belief systems. How do I heal the underlying belief system? Mm -hmm. And so for me, I designed her and she, she looks like the chick from the ring. <laughs> She's like gray skinned. She's the sunken in. She's got like greasy hair in front of her face. And she used to cause a lot of harm in my life. And then I just asked her, what do you need? And she said, I need you to give me a name. I need you to love me. And so now like every morning when I wake up, I cover her in pink light and she doesn't look as harsh as she used to, you know? Um, and, and with her help, like with communicating with this other part of me, I'm able to succeed in my life and not have like these huge wrenches thrown into my path because that's what was happening when she was running the show because I had so much um yeah like contrast like so many contrasted beliefs you know anyway I don't know why I felt called to share that but oh, thank you for no, giving it's, me this space no 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 it's powerful because it it kind of speaks to what I was saying about that moment of where spirit said no you're not ready that it's a big it's a big deal and to be able to somebody to hear this the way you you um explain it is 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 credible because it makes it tangible thank you for giving me that space so yeah some well okay so another thing and it only if you're willing to talk about it again like um i think that i keep hearing this theme of like conscious parenting like you're obviously a very awake and aware individual you're rooted in a lot of spirituality and spiritual experiences how does that translate into raising another human being mhm mm Thank you for that question. And going back to um, the, the conscious partner and conscious parenting, because it's funny, like when you asked me about that, it went somewhere else, but where it went, it was so powerful. Like it took me down this lane of like, it was cool. It's, that's what I love about these conversations. You never know where they're going to go. 
Um, I'll speak to Chris. I'll, I'll speak to Christian first, just because I left him out of there, but because he kind of leads to me having Ari, right? So um, I ended up meeting Christian in 2017 at a retreat. I was a speaker at a retreat in Los Angeles called The Happy Dream, ironically enough, and he was a volunteer there. It's so cool. And um, he was he was one of the you know volunteers doing the cameras, and I met him there. Um, I had been told before I met Christian that I was going to meet him, that we were already communicating in like in the mind which I had never heard something like that before but this woman gave me that um I was speaking at one of the churches at unity in LA and she came up to me she says you're going to meet your partner and you guys are already communicating which I thought was interesting you're going to meet him because of your book I thought I was going to meet like a cool distinguished man like at a bookstore you know tall with the suit you know that was my ideal I ended up see and she says when you see him you'll know you'll know you'll know him I was like okay so I was at the retreat. I came late. I was kind of like hustling and bustling. I sat down and afar, I see this kid with like, look like a kid from the back, like with a, a, a man bun. And then I saw him from the back and then I sat down and I recognized him. Like I felt a connection. I didn't even see the face. I just felt, wow, that's interesting. The energy over there. And he looked back and automatically I felt it again. And then I said, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> he was young and shorter than I thought. He wasn't wearing a suit. He looked like a hippie. You know, it was like all the opposite of what I thought. Uh, to make a long story short, that connection continued throughout the retreat. And not, not in a romantic um, way or intimate way. It was more of a friend. Like we were like cool friends. Like he was, I was like, he was like my little, my cool young friend. Like that's how I felt with him. You know, at Starbucks, he had like hot chocolate. Like who gets hot chocolate at Starbucks? Like that's how it was. Um, <laughs> if you could hear me in the other room, we'd be cracking up right now. Um, and it's ironically enough, out of everybody he can ask in the retreat, he asked um, if he could stay at my house, I think for a day or two before he was going to Colorado. And my roommate was out of town. So long story short, he ended up um, staying at my home where we developed a friendship, really. And he was actually in the aid of my book. Like, remember, she said the book. So he said, why don't we go on book tour? I'll come back from Germany. He, he was from Germany. And he ended up inspiring me to do a book tour when people weren't really doing book tours anymore. They're expensive, right? So he toured with me all over the United States. He was also a spiritual person, also like the Course in Miracles like I did. And um, he would like make me my smoothies before my talks. He would, you know, do the crystals for me and the essential oils. I mean, this gets really good. Like, I was like, oh my God, this guy. This was a very guided relationship because it went very quickly. Um, I felt that spirit was speaking to me and saying, just, this is just, it's just, I didn't even have a say. Like I couldn't say yes or no. It was just a big, let's do this, right? So we met in February of 2017. We got engaged in April, 2017. So that would be a few months later. And we got married in May of 2017 and we got pregnant may we got pregnant in june of 2017 so that tells you that everything happened in six months and it was so guided by spirit i think because of all the work i had done with my relationships this came in and it came in at full speed it came in very hard at the beginning just because it was it was a shocker for me but i felt I can fall flat on my face here. Like a lot of people know me, know my work. Maria did not have a boyfriend. All of a sudden she's married, she's pregnant. Like I could totally fall on my face right now and the whole world would see it, but I didn't give a shit because I felt it was so guided that if this goes to hell, I don't care because this feels so good. And that's how he felt too. That's how he felt too. And that's how our relationship started. And Christian and I have a great relationship because we understand that we're not each other's problems. We are very conscious of that. Um, our communication is is really powerful when we have conversations. Like it's, we try to not put the fault on each other. Um, we come from a space of, listen, I, I believe that you're my problem and this is what I'm thinking, but we're not like you are my problem. We don't come from that space. Um, sometimes I'll, I'll forget and I'll attack or he'll attack and, and it ends quickly. It's, um, a few moments, seconds, hours. We're like, Hey, I'm sorry. That's how we deal with things. Um, and I think it's because we were very clear that the other partner, um, also has their stuff and it's not personal. And I think that that's really important in, in relationship. 
And then with Ari and raising Ari, it's it's a it's very similar the the approach. You know, it's not personal. Um, he's he's growing up. I mean, he's five for God's sakes. If I get really upset with him, I mean, that's it's kind of it's kind of crazy because he's five. That's how I think of it. It's like how can I get so mad at this person, or how can I get so bothered by this little being that that only has had five years of life? Like I have a lot of compassion for him. I have a lot of love and I'm very soft with him I'm also very um uh, instrumental in kind of you know disciplining him but also in stages like my husband is German so his approach is very different than mine because I'm Cuban so I'm more about the chiki 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 cha 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 and he's more about the hut two three four you know so it's it's very it's very different although it's really cool because Ari has structure which also I need structure and then he also has a lot of love and compassion from both of us. And then Christian Christian sees how my approach works. And he's like, wow, that's really cool. And he sees that it works and he's very open. I think you were saying teachable or something like he's very open. So he's like, wow, I like that approach or it really works well with him. Or so I think that that is really important. Like to for me is just doing what I do. And it's very intuitive. Like I, I just know what to say sometimes or I just intuitively know this is this is the right thing or he'll learn this in timing like it's not like what society says that he needs to learn how to ride a bike at this age or he needs to learn how to you know get out of diapers at this age I mean that's great and, and educational but for me it's like it's just a natural process of humans like we're very smart and you know he learned how to swim by himself because he was in the pool and with time he just learned I just feel that for me it's like giving him the confidence every day that he that he he I'm not the authority having an understanding that he is also has a say in things not shutting him down and that he also has free will to say to speak to to be himself without me no 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 there's a time for that especially for safety but I feel it's important to give children their um their that that you are not ruling over them or have this like egoic thing of you need to do this or you need to do that. I don't know. For me, Betty, it's I guess it's a very intuitive way of 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 parenting that I just know that I know in every given moment like how to maneuver things. If I forget who I am, <laughs> I say you know when I forget who I am, it's like when I fall in the illusion. And I become, I call her, I call her Maria La Loca. You know, Maria's lost her mind, Maria La Loca, which we talked about. And I'm very, and I, the thing is, I've gotten so good at this that I'm aware that I'm falling asleep. I'm aware I'm going into the illusion. So I might react or whatever, but I won't feel guilty about it. I'll, I'll just remember that I'm doing the very best I can. I'll ask Spirit another approach. I'll ask Spirit, how should I approach it now with him after? Maybe it's an apology maybe it's another way of doing it next time I'm also real careful like if he spills milk or if he you know I mean if he if crumbs fall on the floor I'm very careful to be like because <gasps> I I love cleansing it I'm a very clean person and I love things you know nice and whatever but I, I've learned that and then he'll look at me he'll say I'm sorry mommy and I said no it's fine like I always try to be very careful because children don't do this on purpose and us as humans we've we have this thing that kids can spill milk or kids can spill things on the floor, which is crazy because that's what they do. <laughs> so when he does it, I'm always like very observant, like my ego or my fears, like, <gasps> but then I catch myself. I'm like, oh no, it's fine. I was like, let's just clean it, clean it up and just be careful next time. But it's that those kind of little things that really help me with my relationship with my son and, and comforting him and supporting him as he gets older. I love, I love that. You know, I think that as like more and more people, it seems like are waking up and becoming more spiritually aware, you know, like these are tools that people need to be aware of as they create families and go on their journey. I love this story about you and your husband. Oh my God. That's like so spiritually guided and so beautiful. It's also very hopeful. You know, like I get messages from people all the time, like asking about pre-birth plans and predetermined spouses and, and things like that. And this is just such a beautiful testimony to, to the fact that as long as you do the inner work, like that's how we can attract into our life, what is actually meant for our path. You know, it's not just like, I'm going to sit here and wish for my perfect partner to find their way to me, you know, like 
if I do the work, which doing the work makes me happy anyway. So like, you know, yes. doing the work makes me a happier person, which then attracts more happiness into my life. And I just, I love this conversation. You gave me so many belly laughs throughout it, which is so great. Just like such a great way to have the day be. And I just want to ask if there's anything else that you'd like to share to feel more complete about our time together. I think that I feel really complete. I'm really happy that you asked me to come on here and, and I, and I loved seeing you there. Cause you were, I saw your little giggles and you were like, it was like, it was really sweet. Um, I, I, I'm just grateful that I think that having conversations like this is very helpful. Um, I've always said this ever since I started teaching formally since 2014, I always love collaborating. I love um, having a conversation with another teacher, with another student, with, with just having a dialogue. It, it's powerful. And also just um, what's coming up um, for anybody that might be watching this is I feel that um what I've learned in my life is that the more that I am aware of my thoughts, the more that I am um, willing, of course, the miracle says, talks a lot about willingness. This is all I need is a little bit of willingness. I always say big willingness as a joke, because this world is big and a pain in the ass most of the time, <laughs> big willingness. Um, I realize that I feel like, and Betty says this a lot too. It's like, we're no different than anybody. Like, I feel that I'm no different than anybody. I feel that all of us have the capacity to get to this awareness um, and, and that you're very worthy of this awareness. You're very worthy of living a life that is um, stress-free, that is um, more go with the flow. And I'm, I'm getting teared up again. You, we're all so worthy of, of living in this consciousness. And I think that if there's a reason why this podcast is coming up. If there's a reason why Betty does the work that I do, the, the work that I do and the work of like so many people are doing now is because of this testimony that there is the opposite. There is love, like the opposite of fear, which is love that is available. And for so long, the narrative has been that fear is normal, right? Or or that all that is normal. And and my, my whole thing is to come in here with a message of, well, how about the opposite of that? How about let's play opposite day? How about if happiness is normal? How about if life and flow is normal? How about if having this opportunity of recognizing that we have everything and lack nothing is normal? Why not? Why, why can that not shift? So that's like kind of what I'm bringing here. It's like, why can't we start changing the narrative of what we've believed to be true for so long because definitely what's coming out now and how everything's changing, there's there's change happening. So um, I want I want you to know that could be you right now, and that it doesn't matter if we're we you know what Betty and I do. Anybody can have this awareness. So that's my two cents. Yes. Oh my god, I'm like so pumped. Like yeah. we can all we all have access to this. It's amazing. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for your for your willingness, for your big willingness to come and serve the community and to share these really vulnerable pieces of yourself and also so much sincere spiritual wisdom. And I always compliment you for how digestible you make it. You know, like these are big concepts that you're talking about, but you're conveying them in such an easy way to understand. And that's so important. And that's such a great gift that you've been given. And I'm so grateful for you. And I look forward to collaborating more in the future. Yay. Thank you, Betty. I appreciate that. Thank you, Thanks everybody. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you.